Здравствуйте. У нас сегодня Good evening. экспериментальный формат экспертного We have this experimental format of analytical club. This is the first time that the expert and analytical club is reaching out to the international audience. So we have interpretation into English today. We have a fairly high number of international guests. The interpretation track is selectable if you're using the PC version of Zoom. Uh, right hand side below, you can switch between Russian and English languages. If you're bilingual, you can you can select uh, the off option and you will be listening to the original. I mean, the interpretation will be by bypassing you. The same goes uh, for the smartphone version. If you're using the smartphone, just like myself, same story, right hand side below, just scroll down the menu, you're going to see interpretation there. Right. So the topic of today's conversation is new, the new Belarus. What happens next? Let me remind you and tell it for the first time for those newly joined uh, Chatham House rule, uh, Chatham House rules. If you wish, if you feel like contributing something to the discussion and you do not want that to become part of the recording or you do not want yourself quoted, before you say something like that, before you drop a quote that you would not like to be like off the record, you will be off the record. We will actually stop the recording. But the guests of the expert and analytical club, uh, they will know that they should not quote you on this on the stuff you said of the record. Okay, so that said, we are recording this session and we plan to most likely this evening, we'll publish it uh, on YouTube. So today, up ahead, we have a quite interesting discussion about to happen. We had 100 plus requests to participate Right now, I see 63 people connected. Once again, welcome everyone, wherever you are. Big hello from Minsk. Also, a big request to those who are not the main speakers at the time. Could you please switch off your microphones whenever you're not speaking so that some background noises would not disturb anybody else listening in? So please keep your mics muted whenever you're not using them. Let me share you, let me share the format with you. Traditionally, it looks like this. There are some discussion agenda, there is, there is some discussion agenda, so there are some questions to be discussed uh, that you've seen in the, in the announcement to the meeting. The speakers take turns and answer these questions. After that, uh, there is a discussion round. Uh, there is a small alteration to the format of the, of the discussion because of new people, quite high number of attendees participating in today's discussion. I would urge you to write your name, last name, your position or who you are and write your question before, uh, write your question after you've introduced yourself. Possibly some questions will overlap, some, so some questions will be repetitive. So I will merge these questions most likely and ask them, voice them myself, or I could ask you to unmute your mic and voice your question. But once again, if you want to take, to take the floor after the speakers are done today, Please feel, uh, please make sure you write about this in the chat, first of all. So if you're using the PC version of Zoom, uh, the chat is below, next left to the share screen, the green button, green button. If you haven't been reading the messages, you should see the four messages, or number four, un unread messages count. So please make sure you introduce yourself, name, last name, your organization or your position, so we will give you the floor, uh, or if the questions are repetitive, indeed, I will ask them, I will voice them myself. Right, so, by the way, 
Let me tell you something else. The priority today, seeing as how the club is intended, uh, is, is geared towards the interests of the international audience, we will give the floor to uh, the guests uh, who are not our regulars. We will give the floor also to international guests who are not participating in the sessions of the Expert Analytical Club. So our regular guests, well, you're not regular, you're incredible, sorry about this. Our regulars, please, uh, do not be offended if we prioritize uh, the foreign speakers uh, should they wish to take the floor. Thank you for your understanding. You guys are incredible. You're amazing. Next, so let me introduce our today's guests. So today's guests include Alexander Feduta, political consultant, political advisor. Uh, Alexander, good afternoon. Dmitry Kuklei, a political scientist. Uh, good afternoon, Dmitry. Dmitry, can you hear us? I do not see Dmitry in the connected attendees list, but let's uh, hope that he will be there soon. He'll, he'll get tuned soon. Next, uh, Andrei Kozakevich, political scientist, uh, Politician Sphere director. Political Sphere in English. Valeria Kostigova, our opinion, наше мнение, editor in chief, Belarus in focus head. Uh, good afternoon, Valeria. Valeria, good afternoon. Right, we, we see you there. Any, okay. Hello, hello. And Vadim Mazeka, analyst at the Belarusian Institute for Strategic uh, Studies. Good afternoon, Vadim. Hi, everyone again. Right. So that's so much for the introduction. So much for the intro part. Let's uh, get down to the discussion. We had three questions up for discussion declared. I would urge, I would, I would encourage the, our esteemed speakers to use round one to answer two of them. Round one of the discussion. What are the achievements of the Belarusian society of the, over the past months, as well as what are the options of uh, the development of events uh, most likely in Belarus? Round one, uh, please make sure you speak on both. In round one of the discussion, we will start with Alexander Feduta. Alexander Feduta, the floor is yours. Thank you. The achievements of the Belarusian society over the past two weeks are significant. Well, first of all, there's been a transfer of experience of self-organization from peaceful time from into, into wartime, war-like time. The first steps of that, I mean self-organization, the first step steps towards that were made uh, during the onset and the development of the pandemic. Everything that was happening during the election campaign, everything that's happening right now, goes to show that essentially self-organization is super awesome. I mean, it's not centralized. It's very, it's very good. Nobody is essentially coordinating the activities of the portion of the population, or the portion of the Belarusian society that begs to disagree, that does not agree with uh, the actions of the current powers or powers that be, with the prolongation of the powers of the president Lukashenko. Another important point is that this coordination, whatever the government might be saying, is happening without any involvement of uh, external parties, external stakeholders, no matter what the authorities are saying. At this point, or by now, not a single serious political player has uh, tried to uh, become an active participant of the Belarusian conflict. Everybody, everybody is taking a side stance, everybody is making statements, everybody is supporting the movement in their own way, trying to get in touch, trying to be in touch with both parties to the conflict. Essentially, 
this is unseen. I have not seen this before, because this is the first time ever where we can say about the interests manifested in the Belarusian opposition, something that you can refer to as Belarusian opposition today from the side of Russia, from the side of, Kreml, of the Kremlin. And that's another achievement per se. Second point I would wish to, I wish to highlight, the Belarusian civil society has become uh, uh, turned to be unprepared to political, uh, the political face-off. We see that uh, it ex exemplified by the actions of this unified headquarters that was trying to separate itself uh, from the uh, previous opposition label. Or, um, they were trying it so hard, they were doing it so hard that now they have been deprived of any possibility uh, to, they have lost any opportunity to engage into any political uh, activity. The Coordination Council, or the Steering Council, let's uh, dub it this way, of a thousand people, plus uh, the managers who are supposed to be uh, supposed to be governing this body. Well, this is what we see as a result of the of, of, of the direction of the vector of moment that this. Uh, Unified or common headquarters uh, has picked during it uh, has picked uh, during its campaign. Now we're dealing with the aftermath. Uh, the third point I wish to highlight is the utter lack, from my viewpoint, is the utter lack of coordination with the workers that on strike. Right now. Ms. Kolesnikova and any other activists, or the fact that any other activists of the headquarters are going just uh, speaking to the people uh, next to the employment, next to the place of employment, oh, well, that's not really coordination. It's just talking to them at the, at the those uh, who are out there, who are visible, have not been able to suggest uh, the proper agenda for the people on strike. They do not uh, They do not wish to become uh, the leaders of their movement. And which is much worse, they do not know, they cannot, uh, they cannot play along uh, this uh, universal strike campaign. This is how I would describe the status quo in the country. Right, thank you very much, Alexander. It's, it's, a, uh, a bit of a more grim, a bit of a grim description of the situation. Uh, other than, well, right now I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Kuhli, but I don't think he's online at this time. So, Andrei Kazakevich, uh, you have the floor. Question number one. The mic's on mute. Can mute taxi. Uh -huh. Again, the mic's on mute again. Да, сейчас слышно? Я слышно, да. Now you can hear me, right? Yes. Uh, okay. Ну что, тогда может какого-то такого, ну вряд ли позитива, right. но so что-то такого. Maybe I will not contribute too much positivity there. Добавить. Я тогда не буду больше говорить. Много времени уделять до анализа того, что было в Белорусском обществе, потому что мы практически не общаемся с Александром. Активизации, потому что нет политического опыта и общеполитического, как бы, скажем так, ну, мышления, да, но мне так кажется, что мы Опять же, это все достаточно было предсказуемо. Сейчас, может быть, по второй части вопроса по сценарию, которые могут быть. Если честно, то как-то, учитывая вот опыт последних двух недель, есть какое-то ощущение, что может быть только два сценария. That is very weird because. Что? You are both speaking on the same channel. Please, переводчиком. Вы на одном канале. Не может быть. Это невозможно. Возможно в настройках, когда. 
possibly in your settings uh, when you select good afternoon you can select the original and you can select uh, russian or english if you stick with english only you will get the interpretation alone, alone. i mean to just uh, speak, speak, speak language language, language. if you're a non-russian speaker it was good so don't to speak, the more people write that it's bad uh, people I'm using the English channel as intended. I'm not sure what's happening with the interpretation channel. Maybe Andre uh, would be better off selecting Russian in his options. No, I didn't think. I don't think he has any options in there. I can try uh, enabling Russian. Well, just go ahead. Go ahead and enable Russian. How about now? So I've selected Russian forcibly. The interpretation is proceeding in the English channel. It's perfect. It's uh, perfect. All right. Okay. So let's okay. Good to go. Let's continue then. I believe that milestone events have happened in the authorities. I mean, in the government. So some of them have been quite structural. And they will be influenced, or these changes will uh, affect the development of the situation in the near, near future. The situation is headed this way. Lukashenko is completely dysfunctional in the new political situation. And I believe that, well, it's quite probable that there are two options of uh, transition of power. Well, first of all, it's in the, the nomenclature kind. The second one is involving or considering the opinion of the protest movement, possibly some dialogue, some form of dialogue, the internal sort. Why Lukashenko is dysfunctional? Uh, because uh, these past two weeks have shown that his main functions within the system are disappearing. I mean, it's, it's not even speculation. It's not even based on speculation. It's institutional analysis. He used to be the guarantor of stability including the business environment, business climate stability in Belarus. Many, many entities, if we're talking about the business community, the business circles uh, close to the power, they saw his value in that. Right now, everything is destroyed. Everything has been demolished. And that's the opinion of pretty many people out there. This has been destroyed uh, without any reason, for no reason. This could have been handled differently by him. He used to be the guarantor of political stability. No political stability is going to be around while he's in power. If he could have handled the situation, could have normalized the situation in two or three days after the elections, uh, it might have been different. But these days, uh, the presence of Lukashenko in the political field automatically spells instability. Well, clearly not too much time has passed. Not everybody has uh, recognized or has realized this uh, to the full extent, but uh, the, the longer we wait, the more the more time passes, the more participants, the more stakeholders to the process will understand that Lukashenko's stability is going unstable, or is switching to if instability. I mean, it is becoming more expensive for the system. If back in the day, if before the elections even, everybody used to depend on Lukashenko, now that with his uh, position undermined uh, domestically and uh, foreign-wise, uh, economically, he uh, depends more and more on his uh, inner circle, which is quite uh, quite small as, we, as it is. And he demands uh, some investment on the part of these people, financial, reputation, the image, uh, other investments uh, to support him. So this is working in the short term, but as the situation develops, I believe that there will be growing understanding for the sake of what, why we're propping him. Why these expenses need to be borne by the people propping his regime that until recently used to be governing the country by these people. The economic situation is adverse. I will not dwell too much on that. And then again, there's no vision on the part of the authorities that the situation is going to get better. I mean, there's no, uh, there's, there's, there's no ways or possible uh, outcomes uh, to stabilize the economy. Any actions that the government takes only aggravate the situation, only exacerbate the situation. This hits the population, this hits the business community's interests. I mean, even people who are close, that are close to the government also are, are also affected by, bad, by the bad economy. 
The political situation surrounding Lukashenko is quite adverse. Before the elections, uh, the uh, Europe and the United States would have uh, seen the would have looked the other way uh, for political prisoners, uh, pr prisoners and bad stuff going on. Unless, as many people have said, something way out of way out of uh, the ordinary uh, could have happened, like mass repressions, mass mass suppression uh, would have happened, then they would notice something that we've seen right after the elections. The standpoint, the stance of the European Union is quite, uh, quite, quite firm. I mean, the result, the outcomes of the elections uh, were not recognized by the EU. Uh, the United States are likely to join this uh, uh, because there have been statements voiced uh, in that direction for a number of re for a number of occasions, and it's obvious that uh, Russia will not be politically or economically supporting Lukashenko. Uh, the game will be more sophisticated, more complex. Is it going to be constructive or not? Well, that's an open question still. There are consultations underway with the European Union, with uh, Russia, with Washington, uh, with Washington for the Belarusian matter. It's uh, different. I mean, the scenarios could be different, uh, but this balancing scheme for Lukashenko scare the West with, with uh, Russia and scare Russia with the West, it's not going to roll. It's not going to fly for Lukashenko, which undermines his current situation even further. Right. Plus, there's this uh, quite uh, challenging or quite uh, peculiar emotional situation of the president that he manifests in some public situation, on some public occasions. That is the message to the elite, that, that's the message to the uh, for external players, that given the crisis, uh, or the, this crisis situation is being mishandled or is, is uh, the President Lukashenko will be Im unable to cope with this uh, situation. He should be thinking about the format of transit of power, although this could take months. It's clear that this might last months, and so on and so forth. So this is the kind of vision I have as of today. Possibly I could have thrown in a bunch of arguments uh, to support my scenarios, uh, to, to support the likely developments uh, I've described. But uh, it's, clear, it's clear that this year uh, predictions are very tough. Many predictions uh, that used to be quite believable, they have been destroyed by, by, by things that have happened. So you got to be cautious with that. Yes, thank you very much indeed, Andrei. Alexander, so you're writing to the chat box. Uh, so. uh, yes, you, you want to elaborate. Yes, just a couple of points from my side. From my viewpoint, Alexander Lukashenko, that had been imposing his own uh, scenario uh, on everyone, is trying to impose it again. That, well, that's a different question whether he will succeed. What is his, uh, his playing for time? His attempt is to play for time as, as severely, as significantly as possible. To make sure that the inauguration happens. As long as he formally announces that, as, as, as formally does that, and Mr. Motion already mentioned uh, uh, that the inauguration is going to take uh, place in fall, in the fall, uh, he, he, Lukashenko will no longer be a limp, limp duck. He will be speaking as the president to everyone, and trying to change the situation will be very tough. I believe that right now, uh, there's very active consultations between the West and Russia going on to understand the ways out of this uh, situation. Because after the inauguration promised to uh, the, the, the transit of transition of power that Lukashenko promised could take four years uh, at least. Although everybody, everybody uh, would like it to have happened within six months tops. Thank you. Uh, can I respond uh, right there on the spot? Yes, of course, just uh, make sure you do it quick. Make sure you make it quick. Yes, I have a different feeling than Alexander. If he were playing for time, they'd be speaking about the dialogue uh, seriously. They'd be uh, gathering round tables and stuff. I, I don't see much uh, playing for time, but quite a lot of repressive actions. So this uh, exacerbates, or well, this, this aggravates the situation time and time again. About the inauguration bit, after the inauguration, he will cease being the president, uh, pre -pre president re-elect, for Europe, first of all, and most likely for the United, for the United States. In which case, the pos his position might not be strengthened, but undermined significantly. 
although yeah it's a, that, that that one uh, requires additional discussion that's exactly why he's saying that he will only speak to putin because putin will not will not tell him no that's uh, another way lukashenko undermines his position he's only linking to one player uh, rather than he's he's uh, following a very narrow tunnel a very narrow corridor he's driving himself that way instead of speaking to multiple parties he's just focusing on one yes thank you andre thank you alexander we have zmitir kuklay joining us zmitir Charlie, can you hear us are you prepared to contribute your intro statement for the two uh, points on the agenda Right, I see no activity on the part of Zmitser. Let's uh, move forward. Valeria Kostyugova, what are the principal achievements of the Belarusian society over the past months and what are the likely scenarios uh, for the development of the situation? You have the floor. Good evening. I would like to rewind a bit, if I may, to talk about the achievements uh, not of the past fortnight, but uh, longer than that. The Belarusians have uh, held this election campaign during which it became very apparent that Lukashenko was not supported by the, major, the, the majority. It became very clear. And uh, the question as to who won uh, as of today is still unresolved, August the 27th. The Belarusians have created, have been able to create this mass movement against anti-Lukashenko movement that until today, again, August, August the 27th, uh, does not clearly say when the inauguration might happen because in the Minsk today in the Minsk today no well, there's, there's no place you can hold it, uh, that you can uh, hold an inauguration ceremony uh, that's for the achievements bit self-organization yes I would also like to say that uh, quite a high extent quite uh, the development of self-organization was manifested that was clearly shown right now professional unions actual trade unions are created uh, are being created uh, that will consolidate uh, during the struggle as, as the struggle goes on just a small uh, op opinion about the steering council or coordination council as you may have heard about it about its uh, shortcomings and drawbacks uh, that alexander highlighted yeah it's tough to disagree with the points he made i mean uh, i believe that the very role of the steering uh, council will be radicalized uh, same as you as you've seen well not radicalized but uh, refined refined would be a more appropriate way uh, uh, the refining of political standpoints of all the candidates that that even ran for president starting from sergey tikhanovsky and uh, that used to be outside of politics uh, as, as they uh, said from day one and they did not have a clear uh, political platform well possibly they were talking about more humanity in our system or they, they, they were wishing to bring more, more humanity uh, to our to Belarusian system under the pressure of the election and of the electorate and uh, given the actions of the government every one of them had to refine their political standpoint their political platform uh, the same is happening right now as we speak uh, on the exemplified by the steering council the steering council wishes to become the uh, platform to talk between, between the government and the public but what the, what the government is doing right now they're prosecuting against uh, the members of the steering council and its uh, management and uh, on the other hand the persistence of the protesters uh, the steering council is being pushed to refine and clarify its political uh, position and uh, uh, there is more urge on them uh, to become more involved more politically involved in the protest i have a small comment here uh, dima kuhle is writing to me he's messaging me uh, somewhere else than zoom he is having a hard time connecting he gets connected and he gets thrown out i don't know if that can be helped i'm not sure either how we can help him join possibly there's connection issues there's quite a large number of attendees connected simultaneously so 
uh, th th there are still slots, yes. Uh, there are still vacant spots, uh, so it's, it's not uh, he's getting kicked uh, because the limit has been reached. We're still well within the limit. I see him joining and uh, disconnecting all the time. Most, most likely that's connection issues. Okay, maybe we'll, we'll get lucky. Remember with Milinkevich, ultimately he was able to uh, give his speech at, in the end. Yes, I really hope that we will get lucky this time as well. Vadim Ajayka? Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold your horses, I'm not done yet. Right, I just made a small uh, side comment about uh, Zmitro's connection issues. Right, so I, I wanted to say, first of all, about the government, what we observe on the other side. What we do observe is that essentially today, the powers, or the, the authorities are short on money. They do not have loans, uh, which they are gunning for everywhere they, 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 they can hold. Uh, the loan interest rates, because of current events, have spiked, have significantly increased, uh, have, have grown significantly. Most likely, this growth will continue. With the law enforcement, uh, the, the Belarus, uh, Belarusian government is short on law enforcement uh, because they clearly have, don't, don't have enough. They're requesting help from Russia. They're short on staff, on, on, on workers, uh, because those who are on strike are not working, and the government is uh, trying to scare them with, uh, with uh, resignations, with layoffs. Uh, and they're also threatening that they will get the workforce from other countries. At the same time, uh, the labor market is uh, in deficit and there's a shortage of uh, labor force in other countries as well, in, in Russia, Russia included. There are no extra people that the government can attract to Belarus. The students, most likely the same. Well, because uh, the new school year is coming, this matter of ideology is raised by the government. So yeah, the, the students uh, might also be not available. The government is also forcing its own official, its own public servants, the civil servants. Uh, they want to, they want them to ignore uh, the tortures. They want them to ignore the blatant violations of human rights. They want them to openly support uh, uh, tortures and torments that are going on against the uh, citizens. Uh, and yes, the civil officials, the public officials are doing that uh, it's a very more it's a very tough moral choice i do not know why the look why lukashenko is, uh, keeps demanding that of his officials of his uh, civil servants these shortages stacked together give us the situation right now lukashenko's regime and uh, lukashenko himself can replenish that uh, only from russia there's there's not a single source available to him at, at, at this point in its turn russia is not really rushing to lend him a helping hand. There's talks that yes, we will definitely help as soon as we see something that requires help or that mandates help, that warrants help. So far, Russia does not see a reason to intervene. intervene. It's, it's, like a, it's, it's like a looming threat, uh, law enforcement's help over our society. It's like an impending threat. As for the loans, then yes, Russia could have considered that, but then again, uh, they're not uh, they're, they're not in a blind rush uh, to give loans to Belarus. So I believe that uh, the matter of Belarus is quite sophisticated and demands quite a lot of attention. To understand better what we can expect from Russia, we should understand that on September the 18th, uh, there is the electoral day in Russia coming less than a month from now. And all those shortages that Alexander Lukashenko experiences right now are also experienced by Russia. September the 18th, Russia will need everything it can have, especially in, in, uh, on the eve of the 18th, because of those uh, turmoil in Khabarovsk, civil unrest in Khabarovsk that's been going on for quite a long time. I mean, you don't have to be a visionary to understand that the 18th of September will push uh, Russians to protest in, in Russia. Russia itself will face protests. So the situation is not determined, is undetermined. The government is not giving the society the opportunity to, to surrender. 
the government keeps pushing towards that, uh, keeping, uh, keeps decapitating the protests, uh, imprisoning the leaders, and instigating the protests at the same time. But there's no way that the population can surrender. There are, there, there is, there are new irritative irritation stimuli for the people that the government just keeps throwing at them. So the government is upbringing the uh, feeling of uh, fairness, the feeling of compassion, uh, the, the feeling of belonging together. That's, that's what the government is doing. So I don't think that we can expect uh, that the protest uh, can be strangled or can be choked uh, completely by the time inauguration is likely might happen. Then again, how do you actually run the ceremony? On the other side, uh, Russia is kind of playing the ally fiddle, uh, playing the ally card, but they're not really interfering seriously into the Belarusian, into the Belarusian uh, affairs. There's just a bunch of uh, propaganda people that they sent, uh, and it's still not clear whether they run, uh, whether they work in the uh, interests of the president or they're advancing Russia's interests. Well, that's uh, as, as clear, as definite as, as it can get. I cannot uh, contribute a clearer picture for the future. Thank you. Vadim? Vadim Mazhika? Yes, thank you, Anton. Indeed, quite a lot has been said. And I believe I should highlight three important points that need to be uh, elaborated on, or that need to be and added. Well, just one thing, the common point that everybody understands, but uh, it has not yet been it has not yet been voiced. It has not been said out loud, and we have quite a number of international guests uh, joining us. I would like to point out something we all know, is that the protests in Belarus are as mass or as significant uh, as ever in Belarus. The 90s, uh, well, mid-sized protests, but weeks, something lasting for weeks, this is unprecedented. There have been crowds of people out in the streets, but uh, it has not been going on for weeks. Now, this is an unprecedented way of political engagement, of politicization of Belarusian society, of Belarusians. Second thing, I've been thinking that the Belarusian government and the opposition have changed their roles. And they have not changed their political roles, uh, strictly speaking, or politically speaking, because it's uh, quite wrong to call the protesters the opposition, because the, the opposition is on the other, other, uh, on the other side. Uh, the majority is out there in the streets protesting. Uh, but they have, uh, they have uh, traded spots, they have changed the spots, like politi interpolitically, domestically. The opposition used to be uh, squeezing out people that were not loyal enough, that, that uh, were not sharing their ideas and outlook broadly enough. Some, somebody that had the right uh, position, the right standpoint, those people were rejected. The old opposition was also quite closed, quite sealed in their elite, uh, comfortable ghetto. Right now, paradoxically, that's exactly what the government is doing. They have changed the spots, they have changed the roles. What Valeria said, indeed, uh, the public officials are tested for the loyalty. Their loyalty is being tested. Uh, they are asked to affiliate with all the manifestations of violence that we have seen. Uh, all the people that uh, the system was putting up with uh, for quite a long time. Well, it's uh, no big news that the Kupala Theater, the Opera and Ballet Theater, are not as po politically loyal to the government as the uh, presidential administration officials. That, that's no big news uh, for anyone uh, in the government. But now it became clear that uh, the, the intelligentsia position is really not fitting the governmental one their standpoint is to leave. And the government will keep rejecting those who are imperfect uh, in terms of supporting, uh, in, in terms of Lukashenko's supporters' image. So we know the adverse consequences it uh, brings about. It's a kind of marginalization, but not uh, like a ghetto, but a, a closed bunker, where the control of the government, the reach of the government, will only be limited by the walls of the Palace of Independence. That's the most radical, radical uh, forecast, but yeah, that, that, that could happen. 
Right now we see uh, the, the opposition imbibing, bringing on board everybody who is who is uh, not uh, on board, who's, who's not in line with the government, who, who does not agree with the government. There are thousands of people walking in the streets and protesting. It's clear that uh, there are many points of divide between them. There are uh, the, the opinions might differ, but uh, they make it secondary. There's something more important on everybody's common agenda, uh, displacing Alexander Lukashenko for getting him to leave. The rest can be resolved at the, at the next uh, fair, fair and free election. I believe that this is the idealistic picture that uh, many people uh, might come to observe, might, might come to figure out. So the opposition keeps attracting people on board, bringing everyone who minds or everyone who's against torture, who's against police violence, that's enough for them to be out in the streets, to be part of the protest movement. That is something that uh, gives uh, ultimate breadth, uh, scope of the protest, which is good. So th this is how they changed the roles. And the final bit, so the third point I would like to briefly mention is the contribution of the protest movement uh, towards uh, the national construction, national, national well, in symbols and com communication. Communication builds a strong a society with strong horizontal ties that is capable of resolving many questions. Well, starting from Alexander mentioned uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, for politics, people see that they can resolve stuff, they can resolve uh, issues uh, themselves without going to the to the guy upstairs, without going to the government. They are old and mature enough uh, to to resolve their issues themselves. Symbolically, uh, the white, red, white flag, is it a divide or not? Well, it turned out that everybody knows exactly the kind of flag that should be flying when they're out on, pro on, on a protest. Maybe 5% of people want to bring uh, the, the green and uh, red flags to the protests. Uh, they do, and nobody's conflicting. Uh, I mean, they're protesting to, together with, the, with, with those flying the uh, white, red, white flags. Uh, no conflict there whatsoever. So that's very important for the national construction uh, that will shape the many years to come in terms of uh, national construction. Regardless of how soon uh, the matter of transition of powers and the main points of protest uh, get resolved. These are my, my, my principal contributions. Thank you, Vadim. Mr. Kukhle is indeed having issues with the connection. So I suggest uh, we proceed to the next point. The next point suggested for the discussion was what can the international society do to strengthen the Belarusian independence and support uh, the Belarusian, uh, Belarusians as a society. Uh, let us take turns in the same order, starting with Alexander Fedutor. Alexander, please unmute yourself. Mike unmuted, right. I have a fairly skeptical standpoint about asking our European friends about what we could ask our Europeans, uh, European friends for. Thank God this is the first campaign that uh, did not split the people geopolitically. That, uh, there was no geopolitical divide. Geopolitics was not uh, high on the agenda. Domestic politics, uh, domestic policy, and uh, domestic dem democracy alone were high on the agenda, and that's not not an upside. That's uh, that's not a downside. That's a big advantage, because the platform for discussion has narrowed down, has boiled down to three points that Svetlana Tikhanovskaya emphasized herself very clearly, and nobody had a, had an issue with that. Nobody minded a single one of those. One thing that uh, the government's reaction tells us is the uh, attempt uh, to dilute or to blur this agenda, trying to throw in, uh, are you with Russians or not, are with Russia or not, the Russian language, Polish separatists in the Grodno Oblast, and the Pol Polish threat to... And it, so, well, uh, the government is trying to impose all that, but thank God no, nobody's really following that. Uh, something that our international partners have done brilliantly, and I would like to thank them for that, is uh, their non-recognition of the election outcomes. This is the first time I've seen this wording 
they did not recognize uh, the fairness, or they, they did not recognize the outcome of the election. Uh, instead of just saying that they were not democratic or not transparent. Maybe I'm well confusing stuff, but this is this this is as best as my memory memory serves me. And the second point is the solidarity shown uh, towards uh, the protesters. Thank you very much for saying that. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much for the statements of Polish Baltic countries universities. All these statements that they are prepared to take in groups of Belarusian students for education if they are thrown out for political, if, if they're, if they're uh, expelled uh, from their home institutions in Belarus uh, for political reasons. Well, it's a bad thing that IT people might be leaving uh, the company. The relocation is uh, quite active. But, uh, well, those people who have not uh, been leaving until now, they will come back when the stabilization is back, when the stability is back. So what else could we ask for is continued dialogue with the Kremlin. I do not, uh, can see, I do not construe uh, the dialogue uh, of the EU and the Kremlin uh, as many of my colleagues are prepared to call it. They call it, to, uh, to, uh, to call it the secret protocols, the Molotov-Ribbentrop agreement. Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. So the impact or the, the, the driving force against Lukashenko is the Kremlin. We should press, we should push Kremlin. Whether we succeed or not, I don't, I don't really know. But I believe that Vladimir Putin will respond to many opportunities that open up for him you know, to prove his ability to be part of the democratization effort for Belarus. And the second point that's quite suspended is China. Unfortunately, it's very tough to play or to push China. But talking about the money where Lukashenko can actually get it from, uh, he can get it from China. That's the actual source of money for him, potential source of money for him. Until today, uh, the headquarters of uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya has been praising Russia uh, has been has been praising has been praising the uh, European Union. China has not seen a, a single personal address. Uh, they have not spoken about China. This is very bad. This uh, talks uh, this speaks volumes about the political advisors that uh, support Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. I believe that the statement about China is way overdue. It should be made. Something else: uh, the diplomatic channels. If there is a possibility to to use those to discuss the situation in Belarus, including the situation of, of Minsk, Beijing, primarily uh, the European Union and the United States. This uh, can and should be done. This should be done, I mean. Uh, because the way I figure, the Belarusian diplomats are quite active in the Chinese direction. China is concerned about the uh, fate of their investment in Belarus is prepared to invest into Lukashenko further because our government keeps convincing them that unfortunately with any other outcome, with any other scenario, uh, the China will not be able to protect its investment. That's it for my part. Thank you, Alexander. Andrei Kazakevich. Your floor, the floor is yours. Okay, so first I would like to support the point that if we're talking about external influence, interna the international community, it has to be uh, US, Russia, EU. Russia cannot, uh, cannot be thrown out, cannot be excluded, uh, because it's a big uh, influence factor. If you don't get Russia on board, there could be the, the consequences uh, could be disastrous. Well, we should rationally, uh, we should reasonably think about that. Uh, China is really a great horse there, although, yes, uh, things have, have been spoken about China. The diplomats th think tanks uh, have gotten together, they were, they, they were talking about this uh, China uh, Chinese bit. Uh, yes, China might contribute uh, some money to support Lukashenko. It's it's uh, merely a question of money, something that's uh, something where the Chinese influence is real. Uh, there are factors uh, that 
go to say that China will not do it. Well, first of all, this is the issue, or this is the question of whether Lukashenko can exist as, as a long-term viable political project. Plus, there is a big probability that if uh, the United States uh, do not recognize uh, him as the future president, uh, as the actual president, this will limit any dealings, uh, well, restrictions. I mean, it will not uh, hold everything that the president signs uh, null and void, but it will definitely affect the situation. Including, the, including China into the mix is definitely not to the interests uh, of uh, Russia and the United States. To have China present here, to have China saving some regime in Belarus, uh, to have China strengthen its positions, uh, its foothold in Europe, it's completely, it's totally unacceptable for uh, the US and uh, for Russia the way I see it. Because the competition, uh, Russia-Chinese competition, is actually quite fierce uh, in, in Asia, in Southeast Asia. So it's, it's, it's an issue for the Russian foreign policy, although, well, it's not really spoken out loud. China might become an issue for Europe as well. They will not like that. Although, let me reiterate, that this is just one of the factors that will not uh, cause Chinese or that, that, that uh, make Chinese intervention unlikely. The Belarusian government was the, the powers that be. How do I put this uh, this way? They're trying to get China involved. So the question, what can the international community do? The question at hand. I believe that uh, the main function right now would be to push the Belarusian government towards some sort, sort, sort of dialogue. In the international community, including expressly including Russia. Let's, let's make it this way. Because the government is shutting in, they are trying to isolate themselves from any dialogue, they, they, they mind any dialogue. Well, and if we, whereas as we're talking about the political uh, decision, political solution of the problem, then there's got to be dialogue. Could be some political pressure, economic pressure, maybe sanctions, uh, maybe uh, targeting the representatives of the Belarusian elite. Uh, well, there is a, a number of mechanisms or points of leverage that can be used. And uh, th that leverage should be used. The next function could be intermediary, the intermediary function. Seeing as how the uh, level of trust between the government and uh, alternative political forces is quite small, plus the political experience, uh, well, the mediation experience is lacking on both sides, uh, then this intermediary function, the mediation function, again, the, the US, Russia, and the European Union could be very constructive be very useful. I mean, there's, there's no dodging this. Uh, the role or the determination of the roles is different. Uh, it's a different question, but it will be inevitable. The way we see the domestic political situation develop, this is a likely scenario. It would be. I also think that uh, the international actors uh, could put some limits for this uh, international intervention. It should not be seen like uh, some foreign will imposed on Belarus, as some for foreign will imposed on Belarus. And thirdly, if there is a transition of powers, if everything follows this scenario, it's very important for the international community to support some plan, some restructuring plan, some reforms support uh, stabilization of the new situation in Belarus some kind of Marshall Plan for Belarus with certain financial backup so that this financial, uh, so, so that this political transition is as painless as possible for Belarus. Thank you, Andrei. Valeria? Yes, uh, something I wish to contribute is this. I second everything that the colleagues have said. I support Alexander's uh, opinion, Andrei's opinion. Uh, what I would like to highlight more is just some individual subpoints. I've heard them mention uh, non-recognition of Lukashenko as the president, uh, compassion towards the people who suffered, continuation of dialogue, bringing, bring, bring the Kremlin on board. Uh, the Chinese issue, 
Yes, it requires attention. Stabilization, putting pressure on the government, pressing them to, to, to talk, to, talk to, to, to engage in the dialogue and intermediary functions uh, should this dialogue become viable and possible. Something I would like to contribute here is two points uh, or several points uh, for, for starters. President Lukashenko is unprepared. I mean, it's not even up for discussion right now. He's not prepared to any sort of dialogue right now. No transition, no dialogue is on his agenda. He does not see, he does not feel, he does not understand, nor he wishes to, why he needs it in the first place, why he needs that dialogue in the first place. I believe that in this case, the dialogue and the conversations uh, should be more in, uh, should be more active with the people and should be geared towards the people uh, uh, that surround Lukashenko. Because this is uh, exactly where it affects them directly, and it will be nice for them to see the prospects. Uh, the high costs uh, that Andrei mentioned to prop up the regime to continue this Lukashenko political project for them to see what it will ultimately result in for the country and for every one of them individually. And there was something else on my mind. I just didn't uh, note it down and I forgot it slipped my mind. All right. So be it. So the most important parts uh, parts are, are voiced. Right now, the hopes of the governing elite, uh, the, the Lukashenko's inner circle, are linked uh, to no dialogue, or they are focused or they are centered around no dialogue. Maybe some workers, uh, but yeah, 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 that's that's the Soviet system uh, that the protesters are out on the streets against. That's exactly what the, pro the what the people are protesting uh, against the Belarusian society. The constitutional reform, right, came to came back to me. The constitutional reform. I wanted to talk about that separately. Is uh, this has been promised by Lukashenko every time the financial crisis hit uh, for for a decade now? He's been promising that. So when he uh, for for political crisis for political crisis. So when he beats uh, the crisis. Uh, he said that, yes, we're up for another political test and uh, then after the elections, it will happen. So this has been going on for a decade and there's not a single reason uh, f for this uh, vicious cycle to stop this time. Regardless of the fact that uh, the, the society is strongly against his being in power. Because Alexander Lukashenko does not want and is, is not prepared to accept uh, the society as a political entity per se, or in its own right. That's it for my part. Uh, maybe I'll contribute something else as we move along or answer a question. Thank you, Valeria. Vadim? Vadim Ajayko. Yes. Thank you, Anton. Indeed, I also second uh, what my colleagues have said, especially Alexei's point, uh, Andrei's points about China. Three things that uh, Europe or the West the European Union in particular could, could do that would be constructive for the positive development of, of the Belarusian scenario. These three measures are let me start with a more realistic one and finish with a more sophisticated, more tricky ones, uh, tricky to implement. Now, for starters, the European soft powers need to be strengthened in Belarus. We see how the Russian soft power is being strengthened. We see the flags, uh, the national liberation movement uh, flags in the pro-government uh, meetings, we see talks of Lukashenko about the patriotic movement, some political entity. We see Russian propaganda people working 
uh, as you have seen, it's not even clear whether they work for, for Lukashenko or for Putin. But we see some very concrete actions of Russia, very specific actions uh, of Russia. So the buildup of uh, Russian soft power is felt. We should see the same from the European Union, supporting the NGOs, uh, the non-governmental media, and uh, helping pro-West, pro-democratic institutions. And thirdly, it's the immediate support uh, to the people who have uh, suffered uh, oppression. It's not just financial, so financial aid, it's also uh, psychological, medical support. People have been injured uh, uh, quite severely say, in some cases. Uh, yes, the black eyes, the hematomas uh, will pass, but some have more severe uh, medical problems uh, because of uh, what happened to them. The possibility of uh, accepting these people and treating them at European medical centers, that aid would be very symbolical. It will be very practical, very practically felt by the people affected. And politically, I think it's a quite, uh, quite interesting uh, way to help because it's uh, not a political support uh, per se, but it's uh, obviously humane action, uh, humanitarian uh, action for the people who were suffered, uh, for the people who were uh, injured. Uh, another point, something that Alexander mentions, uh, academic support, uh, universities offering spots, uh, because the school year is coming, the new school year is coming, and it's obvious uh, that uh, the, this will spike the protests at universities. It is not yet seen because uh, the universities do not exist as uh, organized entities. Everybody's on vacation, everybody is on recess. Uh, if that happens, well, yes, we will see the same stuff that's happening uh, against the, the theater. Well, the academia, the, 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 the tutors, uh, professors will be suppressed, will be oppressed against the same way. So before the new school year starts, uh, we need clear statements uh, that people who have been fired and students that have been expelled, uh, they will definitely get the support from the European universities. Why is it important these days? Why, why is it important right now, particularly? Because these, these uh, repressions will continue. But uh, if we were to make a preliminary statement, uh, uh, there is a probability that these oppressions will not be as mass scale, as, as broad extent, uh, as, as, as they would have been without the statement. Everybody would understand that this is pointless. Uh, and if, if, that is, if that happens, uh, then yes, we will not stop those oppressions. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm disillusioned that way. Uh, but uh, the, if that statement comes, uh, then it will, uh, this actual support, if it's needed, will take much less resources uh, than it would have. And the third bit, uh, the most sophisticated to implement, At this point, uh, the Western borders are closed due to coronavirus. It is opened uh, in some emergency cases, uh, as Lithuania has uh, acted. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs can uh, bring in journalists or politicians for some time, if, if there is a need. Plus, Europe and Ukraine are taking in people who, who, would, who would like to uh, seek political asylum, asylum seekers. But then again, it's uh, radical solutions. I mean, asylum, it's uh, more of a radical solution. Uh, from my viewpoint, uh, when the border is still closed, it will increase the risks of the people staying in Belarus, still in Belarus. And it will be a factor for the government to, to press people who do not even have places to leave. If uh, they're not uh, thinking seriously about immigration, but uh, they just they just they just want uh, to tactically retreat and regroup. This is this military phrase on my side. Tactical retreat and uh, recuperate uh, to come back to Belarus uh, refreshed, uh, refreshed, and uh, I believe that it would be good uh, for. Poland and Lithuania to uh, let Belarusians in, uh, given that the situation with coronavirus is uh, getting better. I believe that it's a bit uh, tougher than pull off. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit tougher uh, to implement than the previous two, but it could have helped. These are the three points that I believe the West could do to help Belarus these days.
Yes, thank you, Vadim. Uh, may I suggest something uh, for the last point that uh, Vadim said? Yes, I'll be very brief about opening up borders uh, for everyone who wants and who needs to leave. The fact that we have the revolutionary situation uh, right now is because of the quarantine that every neighbor out there has declared, Russia and the European Union. What uh, Mr. Majeko is offering is the dream of Mr. Lukashenko, so that the new protesters that have not taken to the streets, uh, they would either go to Russia or they would go to the European Union, they would leave. One thing is people that actually uh, suffered. Quite the other is economical migration. So, beg your pardon, but let's first normalize uh, the Belarusian situation. Normal democracy. Let's make no normal democracy. I'm not talking about economic migrants. I'm not talking about employment opportunities for Belarusians uh, in Poland, say, uh, to get employed and spend half a year there. Yes, indeed, that, that would benefit Lukashenko. What I'm saying is some short-term trips. Short-term trips, uh, it's a very diff different thing. And for an average protester that uh, could have uh, been making money in Poland, but now they can't, uh, they are protesting in, in Belarus. Uh, this opportunity to go for a day or two to Warsaw or Vilnius, uh, they, they, they're not uh, willing to do that. No, they will go, they will go to Warsaw or Vilnius. Well, a political asylum. Any, anybody can, can be some political. Any, anybody can become a political assignment speaker, uh, a seeker. That's not related to what I've been saying. Right. So about this international outlook, international role on the Belarusian matters. We have Andrew Skubilus. Uh, in touch with us, uh, European MP from Vilnius. He would like to say a few words for us. Uh, could you please unmute your mic? The floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. I would like to summarize very briefly. I would try to say, su summarize very briefly. Just a couple points from my side. First of all, something that Belarus has done until today is indeed a historic, a historic miracle. And you don't need our advice. You don't need our advice. What you do need our advice for is uh, how we can do better to help you. That's where we need your advice. This is where the politicians and the society, not just in Lithuania, but pretty much out there, pretty much everywhere out there, uh, everybody is rooting for your success. Everybody is really passionate about you succeeding. Lithuania, the last Sunday, uh, 50,000 people took to the streets uh, and they took to the, this uh, road of freedom. There was a completely extraordinary feeling that there was supporting Belarus, slitting chain of people to the Belarusian border. So the Western reaction, the way I see it, uh, a couple points in that, and uh, several points how I believe the Belarusian society should work, what kind of matters should be worked on uh, internationally. Although the resolution and the victory will be achieved by the Belarusian uh, people, I'm an optimist and I believe that this, this democratic revolution will succeed. Uh, there are all the historic prerequisites, there are systemic prerequisites uh, for that to happen. But the question, the big question is how, how long is that going to take and how the international community can actually help. Now, first off, the Western, the Western world does not have a disagreement as to what happened on the 9th of August. The European Parliament, a week back, the EP had a signing ceremony, every political group signed it, uh, they signed a political statement saying that Lukashenko lost his elections. There's a lot of information that Svetlana Tikhanovska did win the elections, not him. On Tuesday, Svetlana Tikhanovska spoke uh, remotely to the Foreign Affairs Committee with the EP. Um, I am myself a member of this committee. She made a, a very strong impression. Uh, by the way she was calm, by, by her speaking English, and the messages that uh, she actually sent. 
the message that there is a dem democratic, not a geopolitical revolution uh, going on in Belarus, it was showcased uh, perfectly. It was understood and well, well received by everyone. Now, the kind of questions that I see need to be raised by the Belarusian society, uh, the kind of questions to be raised internationally. I have sent messages, I have sent uh, some advice uh, to the steering council, to uh, Svetlana's uh, headquarters. Uh, she should strengthen her international staff, international team, because you have talked about that quite a bit but the way i see the situation myself uh, I, I, I spoke uh, about that in the european parliament on october the 5th or earlier uh, when lukashenko heads uh, for the new re-election uh, for, for the new inauguration sorry he will no longer be the president uh, in the eyes of the entire democratic world out there because five years uh, from his uh, previous uh, swearing in and uh, this uh, this is going to be on the 5th of November. After that, he will not do it. He is a citizen of Belarus trying to usurp power. Nobody can have a conversation with him any longer. I've checked out your constitution, Article 81. What is done? What is the procedure if the presidential position becomes vacant? Uh, presidential elections uh, no earlier than 30 days and no no later than 70 days everything everything is pretty clear so the international society should work uh, for your constitution as well who the next person to talk to would be or the next entity to talk to would be the, the government or the prime minister who will get the official powers uh, if the president is out i believe that uh, the western society where it can be after November the 5th, uh, the president's uh, vacation or the president's vacancy in Belarus is empty. And so the president is no longer there. So some points I wish to voice have, have, have been mentioned. Yes, he will be deciding on the streets and squares of Belarus, uh, the whole lot. But the international players, Brussels, Berlin, Washington, and Moscow. I don't know about Beijing, you know it better. But yes, definitely they should not, uh, or they should be considered. They should not be disregarded. Uh, I need, I, I think you need to voice your opinion. You need to lobby those international stakeholders, the key players uh, that will decide the next, uh, uh, the, the, the next years of Belarus, the future of Belarus. Do not leave them disregarded. Because these big players, these big cities, big capitals are getting together and they're discussing the destiny of Belarus without involving the steering council, without involving the HQ of Svetlana, without anything, without anyone. And I see some strategic points that you need to voice, uh, strategic points you need to raise before Moscow. Particularly, what is the kind of picture, what's the sort of picture we observe? The Western world stands together, the Western democratic world stands together with the Belarusian people. Unfortunately, it looks uh, as though Putin stands with Lukashenko. If we, you know, or if this picture were drawn more vividly by the Belarusian society, that picture would not be pleasant for Moscow. It could have been done this way to Moscow should be put pressure on what uh, to know what what they're risking. If right now uh, Lukashenko is toxic for the Belarusian society, Putin can uh, end up in a similar situation quite quickly. Secondly, I've heard one comment, but I believe that this should be uh, voiced uh, even clearly, more clearly, by either Svetlana Tikhanovskaya or the Steering Council. I believe that the plan that Lukashenko uh, represents and the plan that La Lavrov uh, lobbies, let's hold a discussion about the new constitution and then we'll do, there will be an, an election. Well, this is the conventional tactics uh, of the Russian diplomacy. Play for time, stall, stonewall, and uh, create some long-term chaos, uh, hoping that uh, this muddy water will yield the fish desirable to Kremlin. 
And thirdly, you need to determine very clearly and you need to voice uh, the role uh, that OEC can have, can have, that OEC can play uh, organization for security and cooperation in Europe. Because I believe that tomorrow is the session, the OEC uh, session where Russia, uh, the United States, the European countries, uh, Belarus is uh, participating. And there will be a discussion of the role of this organization tomorrow. I believe that uh, the only role that the new Belarus uh, should demand from this organization is the OEC is the role to uh, orchestrate or to, to arrange the new elections. Do not fall into this trap that the OEC will play the lead uh, or plays play the role of the intermediary or something. This will certainly bring about a long and chaotic process, uh, which is exactly what Lukashenko wants. I fully agree and uh, we agree and you, you, we need and you need, we, we talk about that uh, in the European Parliament, the European Union can start the discussion and can start preparing something that can, called, uh, can, that can be called the Marshall Plan or the Marshall Aid for Belarus. Uh, 50 million that is uh, being discussed right now, it's, it's one thing, they should not end up in the hands of the presidential administration, we take care, uh, they, it doesn't happen. But uh, along with that, uh, some big aid plan must be uh, prepared. I've done the math. If uh, you, the European Union created a 14 billion euro aid plan for Ukraine, for the newly democratic Ukraine, not for one year, but there was a clear package, aid package uh, for the economic aid. Recalculating to the Belarusian side, it could be three and a half, uh, four billion euros. That kind of aid plan should be discussed uh, vocally. It should be discussed by the European Union. Uh, wrapping up the points uh, that you have said about the students, about uh, people in need of help, in need for help. It's very important. What I was willing to know is uh, how the European, uh, how the international community can help to open the doors uh, for democratic process in Belarus. Thank you. Thank you, Andri uh, Andrius. Uh, maybe some of the speakers would like to briefly uh, comment on what he said. None? Alexander, please, the floor is yours. Yes, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Kubirus uh, for the things he said about the calculation, about the amount. Your calculations are very precise because uh, after the 2010 crisis, when the activists of the electoral uh, headquarters were imprisoned, myself included, I was questioned by the law enforcement whether it's possible if the if if uh, the relations are normalized, can the Belarusian economy get three billion euros uh, from the European Union? So yes, your calculations, your your figure is supported by the Belarusian government. They actually asked me that. Three billion, would that be enough? Thank you. I see a question uh, in the chat box from Tatiana Shitsova, an EHU professor. Please uh, analyze the role of, uh, assess the role of Nekta, Nekta uh, Telegram channel uh, in the movement today and uh, currently and for some time to come. Uh, their role in the development of the protest movement. Alexander, I see your hand. Yes, the way I see it, uh, the Nekta Telegram channel has uh, played roughly the same role that uh, was played by the uh, TV channel 5 during the first uh, Ukrainian Maidan, the first uh, Ukrainian revolution. This was the primary source uh, of information. This was the primary source, uh, primary channel to mobilize people. Unfortunately, the Belarusian media field is arranged or is uh, laid out in such a way that uh, we do not have other alternative sources of information. However, 
if we consider the role of the TV channel 5 in the political space of Ukraine, we can say that it had become marginalized uh, uh, gradually. They became the advocates uh, of one specific viewpoint. That was Piotr, Piotr Poroshenko's opinion. And as uh, Poroshenko's ratings dropped, definitely his TV channel also lost its influence. I believe that when democratization actually does happen in Belarus, by the time it does happen, the necessity to mobilize and the, the, the requirements, uh, the need for a source of information will disappear or will not be as vivid as, as strongly felt. Uh, Telegram channels will also be uh, irrelevant, less relevant. Uh, Telegram channel Nechta included. Yes, I agree with that. Uh, Nechta's role is in informational, they contribute information. Yes, there was a role for uh, mobilization. There were some objectives and scenarios uh, for actual campaigns, protest campaigns, but that's not political level. This is not a political level. The role of Nechta is uh, largely technical. There is no way it handles uh, the issues or the matters of uh, political organization of protests. This disruption between the political component and purely informational components over the past two weeks, uh, it, it's, uh, it is strongly felt, it is strongly seen. So it, this, this is an issue. I'd like to elaborate here. As far as Nechta is concerned, we should not underestimate its informational role. I get notifications right now from Nechta during our, during our webinar. I get instant updates uh, in Minsk, like uh, the journalists I haven't seen which are being detained. Uh, there is a live video for that. So the role of Nechta uh, before it uh, became so popular, the wave of this protest was quite uh, uh, quite free, quite liberal uh, treatment of media items, uh, semi-fake news, some advertisements, uh, advertising of uh, telegram channels was uh, with some dubious ethics, uh, like uh, hundreds of people are dying from coronavirus, he's a doctor to help you, some ads like that. Yes, this is, this is not uh, appropriate. And we've also seen some reflection of the events where Nechta more than consciously is, is trying to wage an economic war against the Belarusian system. Again, I think they, con uh, they conscientiously uh, say that there is no currency, no foreign currency in the exchange offices uh, go retrieve your deposits uh, from the banks. Well, these actions uh, initiated by the Telegram channel, they're affecting the uh, currency exchange rate and they can also collapse the banking system. If a Telegram channel pro propagates something like that, is it even ethical to hit the Belarusian government this way? Is it ethical to put the entire banking system under? I don't think that Nechta is asking this question. This is their right. The editor's office uh, is entitled to running whatever policy they may wish to choose. But this is exactly the outcomes of a not really responsible policy, with, with the moral and ethical standpoints are dubious, are not properly weighed. Long term, I agree with Alexander here, uh, in the long term, uh, these things tend to affect the popularity of the channel. Right now, Nechta is a resource uh, to inform of the things uh, that are happening. 2.1 million subscribers. This is the number of people domestically that take interest in the actual events, in, things, in, in, in the things that are happening. But again, this, this does not diminish its political role. I mean, the, 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 there's got to be a role for the entities that are more responsible towards politics. Yes, I would like to add here that nobody is really standing in the way of Svetlana Tikhanovska. Do, do, do not retrieve your deposits from the banks. Do not cancel your deposits. 
do not take money out of the banks. Well, Tikhanovsky could have said that. Well, uh, I think that you, need, you don't need to uh, overestimate the influence of Nefta. There is a political void. There is a lack of political entities uh, that should that would say somehow. So this monopoly will be destroyed. This Nefta's monopoly will be destroyed as soon as these political entities, political media outlets, uh, come come around. Uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya could contribute some argumentative points, some some uh, some points that this should not be done, and people will 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 stop running to the bank. So we don't see a position there uh, from Svetlana Tikhanovskaya's side. Valery Karvalevich wanted to take the floor. Valery, unmute your mic. Good afternoon, or good evening, rather. I've been listening to these speakers, uh, and I keep getting this impression. Uh, they did not hear today's interview of Vladimir Putin. They didn't hear Putin's interview, which is uh, dedicated primarily to Belarus. There's been a lot of deliberations here as to potential dialogue, potential uh, resolution of the Belarusian matter between Moscow and the Western capitals. With, quite recently, Mr. Lavrov and uh, today Mr. Putin have uh, s spelled it out clearly. Belarus is our land plot, it's our sphere of influence, don't mess with it, don't, don't mess with our interests. Uh, this is uh, the translation of the Russian diplomatic into Russian ordinary, uh, common speak. So I believe that these people, uh, well, th this, this is what they have to offer. This, this is the standpoint that they have to offer uh, on Belarus. What else we'll learn from today's Putin, uh, Putin's interview? It's not international aggression. After uh, the international aggression, he wanted the, the Russian green men brought into Belarus uh, to protect uh, the government from the protest the situation. This is a radical change of the situation. Uh, the matter of the Belarusian revolution becomes a geopolitical question. And that means that the Belarusian protest virtually has no chances to, uh, to win. Because in, in principle, beating Lukashenko's regime uh, is possible, that, that's doable. But uh, putting up or to running against uh, the entire military might of Russia, I don't think that the Belarus, Belarusian protest movement can do that. Uh, Russia said that uh, they are prepared to repeat Hungary 56 and uh, Czechoslovakia uh, 68 for Belarus. Next point, again, from Putin's interview uh, suggests that Lukashenko promised something to Moscow in return for this aid, this military aid. We've been talking quite a lot that Belarus is not going to be the same, Belarus is going to be uh, new and different. I believe that uh, the issue of Belarusian sovereignty is up for the agenda, is, is high on the agenda, the Russian-Belarusian uh, relations. And the last bit, the domestic dialogue, the inter-Belarusian dialogue. What Putin did say, yes, we do support the Belarusian dialogue, we support the constitutional reform, however, as far as Putin is concerned, he does not think that uh, uh, Bel Bel the Belarusian president Lukashenko should uh, negotiate with the steering council. He should not be discussing uh, the constitutional reform with the society, putting it differently. The constitutional reform is uh, the entire the, the, the domestic matter of the regime. So Lukashenko is going to change the situation for himself. Possibly following the Nazarbayev scenario, the, the, the way Nazarbayev did, but uh, the Belarus society, not according to Lukashenko, but according to Putin, role to play in this process. Well, I believe that uh, these statements are quite radically changing the situation with, uh, around Belarusian revolution. 
May I suggest something here? Yes, Andrei. We'll need to rewind and carefully scrutinize everything that Putin said. I've been watching some bits and pieces of it today. I believe that his standpoint is much uh, more obscure than that. Who is going to get Putin's aid? Uh, it's not even clear. It's a, there's no clear statement as to who would be the beneficiary of that aid. What Lukashenko needs uh, to support is uh, special forces, law enforcement. Uh, there's, there's, uh, he needs money, and the Russia, Russia is not giving him any. If Lukashenko did get money, it would be clear. And yes, this is Russia playing to keep uh, Lukashenko in place, to prop up his regime. No money, that means the situation is tougher than that, is, is more complicated than that. Well, military, in, in, uh, military invasion of Belarus, uh, there was a very clear statement on Monday from the US State Department, Department of State, that uh, this invasion will be unfriendly from Russia, and this will uh, sever Russia's contacts uh, for, for external political matters. I mean, the Americans will not bring in troops into Belarus, uh, but this will be a serious uh, geopolitical consequence for Russia. Whether Russia is prepared to do that in the situation where it has many points of influence which are non-military, I don't think that Russia will, would resort to that. The same issue was raised by the European Union, although it was milder, uh, worded, worded more mildly. Sovereignty and independence. I believe that Russia's position here is not that great. I mean, it's not clear how the Belarusian society would respond to an in intervention from Russia. And there is also a clear standpoint uh, from the US, uh, less clear from the EU, it, it, it's going to cost them. It's going to be very expensive for Russia, this kind of intervention. Another thing I would say is that uh, there are statement, uh, statements made, it's just a, a trial, or it's, it's just an attempt uh, to impose some rules of play on Russia, to support some format uh, that will be, or to offer format that will be supported by Europe. Well, it's, it's, not to their best, it's not to the Russia's uh, best interest. Well, dropping Lukashenko is one of the partners. I believe that we should uh, consider that as the beginning of the game, of Russian game uh, for Belarus. But I would not be that categoric in statement that there will be political, economic support. Russia is going to support Lukashenko that way. I would not categorically say that. I would not say that Russia is definitely against uh, talking with the steering committee, but again, uh, they will, they might suggest uh, creating some other platform, some other format of the dialogue. And then again, we're early on in the process. I believe that the, uh, this game will be much more sophisticated than, uh, than uh, blunt yes or no, support or no. Even given that uh, even the Russian side, the, 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 the Russian side is showing that there's got to be some transition of power. There's no format determined, there's no kind of specifics, but still they're pushing towards what the US and the, what the European Union are pushing towards. And the final bit I, w I wish to say, the way it happens next, uh, the kind of format that this dialogue will take, or this trans transformation, transition of power will take, it will be determined a lot uh, by whether the promotion process is uh, happening well. There will be some nomenclature transition as one of the scenarios, uh, I've mentioned that, where the government will choose the reforms and they will follow it through. If the process is active or remains active, uh, it will not be ignored. Yes, there will, there will be some talks, some round tables involving alternative political forces. Alexander uh, Alexander Feduta has the floor. He wanted. I wanted to second what Mr. Andrei Kazakevich has just said as to Valeri's uh, statements, criticism. A couple of days ago, two days ago, there was a number of statements made that I would not disregard either. First of all, that's the Ministry of Finance documents, uh, the Russian Federation. 
that says that, uh, four countries should be deprived of benef uh, beneficial interest loans. Uh, Cuba, Venezuela, Armenia and Belarus. Armenia is uh, impoverished, they are unable to repay the loans. Venezuela and Cuba, lack of certainty. Political risks are too high to give them loans, uh, low, low interest rates. And the fact that Belarus is out there with Venezuela should, should not be construed as a political, as, as a positive message uh, by our government. Uh, that's for Valentin's points about financing. And second point, the second point, there was an extraordinary uh, event. Twice throughout the day, uh, President Peskov, uh, the President's uh, spokesperson uh, Peskov is not even neutral, is quite, uh, is quite positive for the steering council. The steering council uh, was uh, joyful about uh, Svetlana Zelikseyevich uh, taking the fifth, uh, but uh, they should not have been encouraged by that. They should have been answering questions uh, that President, uh, President Putin's spokesperson said, official spokesperson. I believe that today's points voiced by Mr. Putin and uh, Mr. Lavrov's statements uh, given all that, uh, Russia would interpret the situation very differently. I need to reiterate myself, this, and please quote me on that. Uh, the artistic uh, company uh, of our Kupala Theater can be built uh, from the steering council, but the platform that gives some actual decisions, uh, that gives actual uh, solutions, unfortunately, it's un uh, impossible to use the steering council to that end. Yes, I'd like to elaborate. Uh, Valery, I'm speaking personally to you. I focused uh, a part of my presentation uh, exactly on Putin's interview. Andrei Kazakevich and Alexander, Alexander Feduto, uh, Feduto noticed exactly what I have. There's no clear promise. There's a conditional promise in case if, and a whole bunch of ifs, what kind of riots or unrest and uh, so material damage to the streets. Uh, Valeria, could I interrupt you there? Well, breaking, uh, breaking uh, a window sh a shop window or burning down two cars, is that a problem? Well, I understand that uh, this is your line, line of thinking. This is how you want to think. I will not uh, convince you otherwise. But uh, the same way the military aid was promised and Lukashenko tried to prove that he needs it but ultimately he failed. So he had to ask for other kinds of help, other kinds of aid, law enforcement support. And it was also conditional, uh, the same as the military aid. Yes, Russia is your ally, Mr. Lukashenko, but please show us, show us why we would interfere, why we need to in the first place. And uh, Mr. Putin said, <laughs> Well, I agree with uh, th there is a lack of necessity for such and if you do that here, it's a big question to the steering council and the civil society at large. If we understand correctly what uh, Mr. Kubilius said, there have to be more clear statements, more, cons uh, more, more precise statements. Russia cannot be interested, uh, well, in terms of uh, preserving Belarus liabilities uh, before the Russian Federation the way it, it has them now. And Russia uh, is definitely going to be alarmed about the prospects. Russia refers to the steering council as an entity, but indeed uh, they dodge any, well, this, this entity is dodging any responsibility in, in this matter and uh, quite a number of others. But saying exactly what Russia is up to, uh, what Russia is going to do, it's quite difficult to say that uh, firmly. Yes, all of us can say that, all of us uh, can drive it to the point that yes, uh, Russia will take Lukashenko's side. But again, that will take a lot of steps for the government to, to make. No protests in the street, I don't know, some kind of dissolution, a self-dissolution of the steering council, maybe go abroad for the open visas or some other steps. I mean, Russia will need to see something going on. This is not the case right now. 
and the Belarusians have a, a strong play in their, in their destiny and a strong role. Vadim, yes, I'd like to elaborate. I agree with uh, what uh, the colleagues have said for the external political factors. Contextually, uh, I would like to say about the domestic politics. I believe that as of 2014, this was clearly seen in the electoral, uh, electoral campaign of 2015, uh, Lukashenko directly uh, blackmails uh, uh, the society, with, it's either me or Putin. As we saw in 2012, this, uh, this one flew and people did not protest, even the traditional uh, politicians, opposition politicians, uh, they said that no protests uh, should be allowed because yes, there will be Putin and Putin's tanks in the country. Right now, the protests that we see and uh, attempts uh, to go to Putin is just an attempt to uh, continue that blackmail line. Uh, that, uh, this blackmail will continue uh, as long as Lukashenko is in power. It is, it's going to be endless. He'll be playing that card time and time again. It's just uh, this time the Belarusian society is not played with that. I mean, they did not fall for that. Yes, they do realize that the threat is out there. They realize that it's very uh, necessary to send the right messages and to work with the Russian threat uh, from domestically from Belarus and uh, from international players. But it does not mean that uh, the situation with Lukashenko should be put up with forever as long as Putin is alive, or as long as Putin is in power. The Belarusian society clearly said that uh, even though the Putin is nearby and looming, uh, Belarusian society will not tolerate uh, what's going on. Stuff that we are discussing here is on a political level. Yeah, we could convince other, each other otherwise, but the people in the streets, uh, they have a very different opinion. The question for everyone, do you believe that uh, the European Union will not recognize uh, Lukashenko as the legitimate president uh, after inauguration? And how it's going to look like, what it's going to look like practically? Okay, let me do this, do this one. This has already happened, de facto. Plus, we've had uh, confirmations uh, from Adrius Kubilius, from an EP uh, member of parliament. Uh, what happens in practice? Well, it's a toughie, because practically many things can happen. The state will be preserved. Some transactions will keep uh, happening, even some personal contacts and visits, if uh, this sort of thing is offered by Europe. But it has one important consequence. Any decision of the Belarusian authorities uh, can be questioned and uh, deemed illegitimate. That's everything for uh, international agreements, like sale of property, privatization of property. This whole uh, array can be uh, deemed null and void. Uh, null, uh, can be deemed. It, it, it can fly, it, it, it might not. It can work, it might not. But then again, uh, Lukashenko for the international community, for business, for the business community domestically, uh, becomes a risk investment. There's more and more additional risks so that this property can be lost. Or some intergovernmental treaty might in the future be deemed null and null and void. But again, it's a problem with Russia, like uh, deprivation of Belarus of its sovereignty. When Lukashenko was weak, it were, Russia was a good partner, was weakened. Uh, this, this was the objective this year uh, for the Kremlin, early on this year. Now he's too weak and all the agreements reached with him will be questioned by the Belarusian society, by the international society, and that is a serious problem for Russia. So yes, this would be my answer to that question. Although there's a whole bunch of unclear tactical points uh, of how and what should be handled. Anyway, this uh, complicates the Lukashenko's current situation significantly. Alexander, yes, I wish to say what the European Union can, can do. It's a failure to recognize or non-recognition of any uh, appointments made after the inauguration of November the 5th. Uh, the diplomatic passports will not be uh, held valid after the 5th of November plus the accounts of uh, the enterprises, uh, public banks, uh, public institutions of Belarus, foreign accounts, whether those accounts uh, will be uh, active or will be usable. A part of them can be frozen. 
uh, and it will be unfrozen, uh, it will be released uh, when the new democratic president is elected. Well, this is not going to fly because it's not uh, directly linked to the legitimacy of Belarus. It's a different jurisdiction. I mean, uh, new deals, uh, sale of property, uh, privatization, something that's related to uh, Lukashenko's uh, activ activities, uh, actions of his government, those could be questioned. Just a second, I wanted to voice a question. Yes, we are nearing the completion of our discussion. Kirill Garoshko had a very sophisticated question. Maybe you would like to uh, unmute yourself and ask it personally. Kirill Garoshko? Uh, he's not around, possibly. Okay, I believe that's it, because the questions have been discussed, so we've made it within two hours. There's a question from Ludmila from Poland. Uh, how, how, how can we help the people on strike? Where are their leaders? This practical question, how can you help, how can you help people on strike? Well, I can give you a brief uh, answer. Uh, there are two uh, donation campaigns uh, in on Facebook, two of them on Facebook. Uh, they're easily searchable and you can respond to that. The leaders, well, that's a long, that's a long conversation. Uh, the leaders will come around whenever there is a need for them. Since they're not around, there's not much need in them. Well, I would elaborate. I, I keep getting these questions from the Russian and Ukrainian TV. Uh, the answer is very simple. Uh, any leader that uh, surfaces are, are sent to prison. A new leader and me appears and bam, uh, they get imprisoned. And two, ones, uh, two new ones uh, take his place. So this is the process that we, we need to reconcile with. So uh, it's like uh, the battle of uh, Heracles uh, with, the, uh, with the Hydra. One, uh, one, the, the Lernian Hydra. One head had been cut off and three new ones pop up. All right, seeing as how we have five minutes uh, before the two hours. Kirill Garoshka, question. If Lukashenko, before his inauguration, openly suggested the society, his scenario of uh, going out of the political crisis, uh, like the government sits together with the society and publicly discuss the new edition of the constitution for two years, for two years. Uh, and that constitution will say that uh, two terms uh, at the most and part of his authority will be uh, delegated or uh, decentralized. After the prepar preparation of the constitutional draft, a refer referendum is hold, uh, held. Uh, the new constitution, once it's uh, uh, approved, uh, six months after there will be nations, uh, national elections for all institutions without Lukashenko. At the same time, there will be uh, opposition and oppression against uh, pretty much everyone. Lukashenko will be uh, trying to scare anyone who, uh, who will doubt uh, the appropriateness of, of this uh, suggestion. I mean, the message would be this. Is it a positive scenario to uh, resolve the political crisis? So otherwise, uh, there will be much blood spilled. Well, many Belarusians support that. Well, I don't think uh, that Belarusians will trust the president. Uh, so two years is eternity, given the pace of uh, events, development. I don't think that this uh, two-year amendment of uh, the constitution, this only plays uh, to the favor of uh, Lukashenko. Other, other entities will not benefit. And there's a third factor. Never, never, not ever would Lukashenko to say it himself. He will never suggest that. He will never put that on the table. Yes, I will, I'm also afraid that this is the case. All right, so I believe that this will be it. I would like to thank all the speakers uh, for their uh, participation. Andre, Alexander, Valeria, Vadim. Thank you to all the attendees. Uh, thank to all the people who have tuned in from various uh, cities, uh, various countries of the world.
До новых встреч. At the Expert Analytical Club. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for your participation and solidarity. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues.